To start with, first we wanted to motivate why the new feature is needed by, explain, by talking a little bit about uh, the macro system as it exists in uh, Basel 7 and earlier, which we are retroactively naming uh, legacy macros. A legacy macro is uh, simply a uh, startle function, arbitrary startle function, which is called in the build file or in another macro and which instantiates some targets. Typically, authors of uh, legacy macros uh, create them in such a way that the call to a legacy macro looks like the uh, declaration of a root target. So uh, let's look at a very typical example. Uh, here uh, we have um, a legacy macro uh, which takes a, a collection of source files, uh, runs them through a tool to generate a, CP a single CPP source file and then builds that CPP source file uh, to get a single executable binary. Uh, what are some interesting features to point out? Well, first of all, the parameters to the legacy macro more or less correspond to rule attributes, typically. Uh, the first parameter, typically, again by convention, uh, is the name which corresponds to the name of the um, so-called main uh, target that the macro instantiates. In this case, that's the native CC binary target. Uh, the names of the other uh, targets, uh, in this case, uh, the generated CPP source and the general um, are uh, derived from the name parameter, typically by suffixing. Uh, typically those auxiliary targets uh, are not considered, uh, are considered implementation details and the macro tries to hide them by for example giving them visibility private. I will explain later why this doesn't quite work. Uh, and what else do we see here? Um, we see that the general calls a tool. This tool would need to be visible to the build file that calls the macro. What are some problems with legacy macros like the one that we just looked at? Well, problem number one is that it, it was an ordinary Starlark function with uh, untyped arguments which were passed by reference. Trivial problems, uh, your user might try to call your macro uh, with the wrong arguments or perhaps you might make a mistake and accidentally try to mutate one of the arguments in place, easy to work around. Less easy to work around. Uh, Let's say your macro is expecting a list of labels by which it expects to examine or modify in some way. But instead of a list of labels, your user passes you a select expression which uh, once it's configured is going to evaluate a list of labels. And currently in Starlark you cannot uh, examine or modify the contents of a select expression. So what do you do? Well, some macros just YOLO it and hope that nobody will pass a select to them. Uh, and other macros change their behavior depending on whether the parameter is a select value or not, which is not ideal either. Another less trivial uh, uh, issue, uh, strings versus labels. Um, if you are a legacy macro author we, and, and you want to transform a string into a label object, for example, to serialize it in some canonical format, you need to be very careful about the difference between the label constructor uh, versus native dot package relative label. In 99% of cases, what you want is native dot package relative label, except for that 1% exceptional one. Uh, and this is a common foot gun that many, many macro authors have encountered. Uh, another problem, uh, legacy macros can promote and hide inefficiency. You might have a build file which looks like it declares 10 rule targets, those are not rule targets, those are macro calls which expand to more macros, which expand to more macro calls. Uh, you will get a million targets in your build file in effect, uh, which add a visible pause to uh, the loading phase of your build, even though you might only need one of those targets as a dependency for something. Um, another issue, if you are editing BZL files um, and the BZL file happens to be uh, transitively loaded by a bunch of macros that your repo is using, and that edit to the BZL file might invalidate most of your build graph, even if it doesn't actually change any targets that your build needs. Problem number three, uh, legacy macros have uh, very limited control over their API surface, by which I mean the distinction between the targets that you as the macro author want your users to see versus the auxiliary targets which are intended to be just implementation details. 
A legacy macro cannot hide its auxiliary targets because visibility private for a target which is defined in a legacy macro or at the top level of a build file still leaves uh, the target visible to other targets in the same package. Uh, and conversely, a legacy macro cannot declare that another macro is going to be its friend and give it access to some of its internal targets without also giving whoever whatever build file calls that friend macro, uh, the ability to depend on those internal targets. And of course, uh, as I said before, tools used by legacy macros must be visible to every package where the legacy macro might get called, uh, which in practice means that those tools usually have to have public visibility even when that would be otherwise undesirable. And finally, because legacy macros are very flexible and very expressive, they can confuse uh, maintenance tools and scripts for your repo. S typically, those tools might expect a, an ordinary build file which looks like it contains a sequence of rule declarations, at least syntactically. Uh, but some macros don't look like rule declarations. For example, they might return a value, or they might not have a name parameter, or even if they have a name parameter, they might declare targets uh, whose names don't derive from the name parameter or derive from it in strange ways. And then there are legacy macros whose behavior depends on their lexical position in the build file. For example, if they call native.existing rules, and I'll talk more about that specific problem later. So, what's the solution? Thank you. Okay. The solution, as you might have expected, is symbolic macros. So if a legacy macro is an unstructured function, a symbolic macro is a structured function that has certain rule-like capabilities. And defining a symbolic macro is much like defining a rule. So the macro um, call takes a set of type attributes and an implementation function. And the implementation function has the bulk of the logic. If you're thinking about migrating a legacy macro to a symbolic macro, this implementation function might be what your macro call looks like today. Uh, it does take the uh, rule naming convention in that now it's a private function, um, but otherwise pretty much the same as what you might expect. The biggest difference is that the implementation function has to take a name parameter and it has to take a visibility parameter. If you take a look at the attribute declarations, though, the name and visibility aren't included. You get them for free. Um, your attributes need to be typed with any of the types that rule attributes can take. So they can be a label list, a Boolean, a string. And by adhering to those types, you get type checking for free and also do documentation. And if you pass in a label, it'll be parsed relative to the build file where the macro is declared. One thing that's particular about symbolic macro attributes is that they take this particular configurable parameter, and that determines whether this attribute accepts selects. So if it's true, and it is by default, if you pass in something to this attribute, it'll be kind of promoted to a select. And the idea behind this is that you as a macro author uh, are kind of forced to handle selects correctly from the beginning instead of being surprised by a caller of your macro 100 miles away having an issue much later. Um, or you can decide that you don't take selects by passing configurable equals false. Uh, one note is that because all of the attributes need to be declared, the pattern of passing star star quarks to your macro doesn't work as it used to. So you can't really use it as a catch-all. You do need to uh, declare each of the attributes that your macro accepts. Um, but there is good news. Pretty soon, we will offer attribute inheritance, which means that your macro will be able to uh, express what rule type it wraps, and it'll get that rule's attributes for free. So all of this structure together hopefully provides a solution to a lot of the issues with macro parameters. And in addition to adding some structure for attributes, symbolic macros also restrict the naming of the targets that they create. In particular, symbolic macros have to create uh, targets or sub-macros that are named either the same as their name parameter or have the name, the name parameter followed by one of the valid delimiters followed by some string. Uh, 
So in the example we looked at before, this macro creates two validly named targets using the underscore delimiter, but it could also create a target that is just named name, or it could use one of the other valid delimiters. Uh, it can't, though, uh, use some other random delimiter or otherwise uh, violate this prefix naming schema. Um, there is good news, though, if you happen to do this, for example, because your macro wraps a rule that creates targets or files that violate the naming schema. Uh, we will quietly ignore that target as long as you don't try to depend on it. It's also good form not to create targets or other macros that infringe on another macro's names namespace. So in this example, we have two symbolic macros, and they both could create a target called foo under bar or a variety of other names. Um, it's pretty confusing to reason about as a reader, also as a tool. And it also interferes with the upcoming lazy macro expansion. So with lazy macro expansion, we'll only evaluate the macros that are actually required for the build. So that avoids the issue that Sasha alluded to before, where you have a build file, you have a bunch of expensive computations from macros that you don't care about, and then in order to retrieve the target that you do care about, you need to do all that computation. If those other macros are symbolic macros, then uh, you can just request the target that you care about and not have to do the computation for the other macros. So going back to the naming schema, imagine your request target foo bar. You can imagine why this might be detrimental to laziness um, because either of these macros could have created foo under bar. And that means that Bazel first needs to evaluate symbolic macro foo, do the expensive computation, only to find that it didn't actually create foo under bar, and then it'll go ahead and evaluate macro foo under bar, which did create target foo under bar. So if you follow this naming schema uh, and exclusively name macros so that they don't interfere with each other's namespaces, then a eval uh, lazy evaluation will reduce the costs um, of build file evaluation. One thing I'm pretty excited about with symbolic macros is the visibility um, that they offer. So you might be familiar with this pattern. You have a legacy macro, it has a general, general uses some tool. You create an instance of this macro in package, and then you update the visibility of the tool to include the package. So far, so good. And then you create another instance of this macro in another package, and you go ahead and update the visibility of the tool to include that package. And then you create another instance of this macro in another other package, and you have to update the visibility to include that package, and pretty soon your tool has public visibility, even if that might not be exactly what you'd like to express. With symbolic macros, though, if you use this tool in that context for a macro defined in the macro package, then the tool only needs to be visible to the macro package. And I'll note that this is true um, regardless of whether you refer to that dependency in the body of the macro or whether it's the default value of an implicit attribute that you have. It is also true if your macro calls another macro, uh, we only care about the layer where the dependency is actually used. In addition to no longer forcing public visibility for tools that are used by macros, uh, symbolic macros are also better at restricting the visibility for targets that they create that might be implementation details. So check out this example. We have a macro, it creates two targets. The first one is a, an implementation detail. No one else should depend on it. It's used by the general, though. So for a legacy macro, it needs to be public in order to be able to be used by that general. Um, but in a symbolic macro, you can say that the visibility of that target is private, and it'll still be visible within the macro itself. 
And this is the default, by the way, this uh, private visibility for targets created within macros. So you can also spell it without passing the visibility attribute to the target. And if you did want to export that target and you expected it to be used outside the context of the macro, you can thread through the visibility from the caller. And notably, this shouldn't have to be visibility equals public within the body of the macro, because that means that the caller can't uh, restrict the visibility as it would like. Um, the visibility also behaves a little bit differently than in rules. So a target that's exported by threading through this visibility will always be visible to the caller without having to specify it. So as you can see, symbolic macros offer pretty good visibility granularity. And they also, also uh, constrain some unruly behavior, which is pretty good for tooling and also for humans trying to reason about macros. So in particular, symbolic macros can't return values. They can't call native.glob, native package, native environment group. And they also may not call native.existing rules unless they are these special finalizer macros. So uh, why would a legacy macro want to call native.existing rules? Um, this is going back to problem number four that we talked about at the beginning. Um, well, in large Bazel repos like uh, the Google Mono repo, you often see a pattern which um, I'm going to refer to as an epilog macro. It's a legacy macro which calls native.existing rules uh, to examine attributes of rule targets and enforce uh, project-specific policies like rules about naming, uh, con uh, conventions about what sources and dependencies need to be. Very often the legacy macro, the legacy epilogue macro is going to declare new targets, for example, a new test target per each existing rule target, or maybe combine those test targets into a test suite. And uh, since the legacy epilogue macro relies on native.existing rules as its input, such a legacy macro can only perform its checks if it is lexically located at the very end of your build file. And this position has to be enforced either by manual code review, which you have to pay attention to, uh, or by some sort of an automated hook in your CI system, which again um, needs to be checked. And there is an interesting question of what is supposed to happen if your build file happens to um, call two or three or more epilog macros in one build file. And this is a situation that we actually have seen at Google. So uh, our proposed replacement for uh, legacy epilog macros are rule finalizers. Uh, a rule finalizer is a special type of symbolic macro. You declare it by adding a finalizer equals true to the symbolic macro declaration. And unlike normal symbolic macros, it is allowed to call native.existing rules. But inside a finalizer, native.existing rules behave specially. Uh, so it returns only the targets which were not declared by any finalizer. So a finalizer cannot see targets declared by other finalizers or by itself. And uh, the uh, finalizer, regardless of where in the build file lexically it is called, will only be expanded in the final stage of build file evaluation. After all, uh, symbolic or legacy macros have been uh, expanded. And therefore, the behavior of the finalizer is independent of its lexical position inside the build file. You can treat it like a normal uh, macro call or like a normal rule declaration, as far as uh, tooling that manipulates build files is concerned. You might ask, how could rule finalizers possibly be compatible with lazy macro expansion? And the answer is they're not. A rule finalizer needs to see the targets instantiated by all non-finalizer macros. So if you ask Bazel to run a test which belongs to the finalizer's namespace, then unfortunately, uh, all the other macros in the build files will have to be expanded. They'll have to be expanded eagerly. But the interesting question is, uh, what should Bazel do if uh, the build file contains a call to a finalizer? but no uh, targets belonging to the finalizer's namespace were requested by anything. And then the right answer be, uh, depends on your use case. Uh, for example, in a, a CI or CD system or a production build, you do want to expand all the finalizers uh, because you want to make sure that you evaluate any asserts 
uh, in the implementation of the uh, finalizer, which might be enforcing project-specific policies. But on the other hand, if you have an IDE, and in an IDE, the user has just opened a build file and is making some edits, the most important thing for you is um, interactivity, low latency. So in that case, probably you don't want to expand the finalizer because you don't want to force eager evaluation. So there is no single right behavior here, which means that we will be adding yet another flag to Bazel, and whatever system is invoking Bazel, the CI system or the ID, will have to set that flag appropriately for that particular situation. When are all of these wonderful features going to land in your Bazel? Uh, so, symbolic macros and real finalizers, uh, the basic version without laziness, will be available, enabled out of the box in Bazel 8.0. Uh, we hope to get lazy expansion into Bazel 8.x for some x greater than or equal to 1. Hopefully 8.1, we're aiming for 8.1. Uh, but since lazy uh, macro expansion is going to be an incompatible change, in the Bazel 8.x series, uh, laziness will be um, opt-in via flag. Also, in uh, 8.x, we will um, add attribute schema inheritance so that uh, a macro can inherit attributes from a rule or from another macro that it is wrapping. Uh, and we are going to be adding a syntax for declaring uh, additional target name patterns for a macro. For example, for supporting um, libfoo-source.jar files that you often see in um, Java and Android and Kotlin rules. Hopeful maybes. Uh, we've had requests for additional attribute types for macros. Uh, in particular, a schema full struct valued attributes. And uh, we are also considering a BZL file change pruning, which is a feature that um, would be enabled uh, by refactoring that we are doing for lazy uh, expansion, so that an edit to a BZL file would only, would only invalidate macros that use symbols from that BZL file, rather than uh, entire packages that transitively load that BZL file somehow. All right. Uh, Usage documentation for symbolic macros uh, is uh, currently live on the Bazel build site. And we have um, in the uh, Bazel build examples uh, repo uh, some worked examples for how you might use um, symbolic macros. Uh, for that, you will need a Bazel uh, 8.0 RC1 to run those examples. Any questions? Um, I was just wondering what the plan is for legacy macros, because they are just ordinary functions, so I'd imagine it be, would be pretty difficult to get rid of them uh, or like ban them, but also like if they're not removed, that could mean that, some, that there's some fragmentation in Bazel code. So, Currently, we don't have any plans to uh, remove uh, legacy macros, because again, they are extremely useful. And if you are writing code which needs to be compatible with, my, with multiple Bazel releases, you, of course, have to use legacy macros. Um, we'll see in the future. It, from my perspective, it's something that we might declare is poor style, but I, we have no plans to ever disable them. Okay, thank you. Uh, does the symbolic macro implementation in Bazel 8.0 um, handle common attributes, things like test only, for example, or would I have to explicitly add these in the attributes list if I wanted to use them today? So it only includes name and visibility right now. Uh, the common attributes is something that we'll be adding as part of attribute schema inheritance, hopefully 8.1 or 8.2. Awesome, thank you. Holy crap, this is awesome. Uh, one complaint we get quite a bit is inner targets created by macros are um, turning our queries into garbage. So this seems like an opportunity. Uh, could we somehow trim inner targets that are, are private out of query results? Uh, please file a feature request. That sounds like an interesting feature that we should add. Are there any limitations on interactions between the two styles of macros? Can you call legacy macros from within symbolic macros? Yes. 
Hi, uh, about the finalizers, um, I might be wrong, but I remember reading in the documentation about symbolic macros that this would pave the way for getting rid of the existing rules. Can you talk about this? Uh, the native dot existing rules API has numerous words in uh, how it transforms um, existing rules attributes back into back from the native Java values into Starlock values. In some ways, it's rather unintuitive. Uh, so. First of all, we are planning to make native.existing rules deprecated outside finalizer context. And second, uh, we are going to be either revamping native.existing rules API by adding extra options to it, or possibly replacing it with something new, but again, something that will be usable inside finalizers. But that's uh, for Basel 9. Thanks. Hey, uh, are you planning to make any tooling that would convert like well-behaved legacy macros to structured macros? I am very excited about this, and there are a few things that are in the pipeline before we get to tooling. Great. <laughs>